All right, good evening everyone, and I am Dora Loera, and I'm here to present to you guys um, Edgar Casey on pack stoops and poultices. So you guys ready to learn a lot tonight? Okay. So the, our disclaimer is the main source of this information um, used for this presentation came from the Edgar Casey readings, and there were other sources that I used on um, those three books on the table were some of my other sources. Um, all of the information presented um, is subject to personal interpretation, and uh, we invite you to continue to research this topic for your own clarification. So who is Edgar Cayce? I don't know if anyone, everyone knows who Edgar Cayce is, but he was a 20th century psychic and medical clairvoyant. Um, he was born in Hopskin, Hopskinville, Kentucky in 1877, and his psychic abilities began to appear during childhood years. Um, as a young adult, he discovered the ability to put himself into a sleep-like trance and uh, reach a super conscious state of mind, not super super, but super conscious state of mind. Um, it was during that state of mind that he was able to connect with the universal consciousness and was able to respond to a multitude of questions posed by many seekers. He devoted most of his life to using his clairvoyant gift and helping, helping thousands of seekers. And he was the most documented psychic of the 20th century, and he's also known as a sleeping prophet. The majority of his readings that were over 14,000 documented readings were given on holistic health and the treatment of illness. And this is why he's also known as the father of holistic medicine. And the definition of Pax stoops and poultices, I knew about Pax and poultices, but stoops were kind of not familiar to me. Basically, a stoop is like a, a pack, a moist pack. So um, the Edgar Casey readings often recommended the use of pack stoops and poultices for a wide range of health problems. The materials most commonly used for these remedies were like wool flannel, um, cotton flannel, washcloths, or cotton gauze. And um, most of them you'll see here, and I'll, I'll demonstrate some as we go through all the packs and poultices. So. A pack is basically when a material like wool or cotton is used, uh, is dipped in hot water, or added, or castor oil is added to it, and um, then you can apply it to an area and put a, a hot pack over it. A stoop is when something is added to the water, like glycothymoline, such as what we have on the table here, um, or turpentine spirits. Um, stoops were often used with a hot or wet, a hot wet cloth and it was applied um, externally to increase, sti uh, inc increase or stimulate circulation to your skin. And poultices um, is when a clay, a plant, or dried herb or food is used, and um, like salt and apple cider vinegar or dried mustard, grape, moline, onions, or potatoes, um, a warm, moist preparation placed on an aching, inflamed part of the body um, to ease pain, improve circulation, or hasten the expression of pus. So I, basically to pull out infection and pus from the skin. And there were like 14 packs that were often recommended in the readings, and there's many of them, so I'm only gonna cover five of them, but they were the castor oil pack, cold moist packs, the Epsom salt stoops, glycothymoline, the grape poultice, um, there were the, the hot moist pack, and then the hot salt and apple cider vinegar poultice, the mud, kaolin clay poultice for um, skin and the face, and the moline poultice, mustard plaster poultice, onion poultice, potato poultice, and then turpentine stoops. So there was many of them. So the packs, stoops, and poultices that we're going to cover today are castor oil packs, the great poultices, um, the Epsom salt stoops, and the glycothymoline stoops. And a little bit on castor oil. When I started reading about castor oil, I, I mean, I knew about it, but when I picked up that book written by Dr. William McGarry. I just kind of got lost in it, and this presentation took much longer because I started reading, and I, yeah, I got really absorbed. It's really fascinating. So castor oil applications were one of the most common Edgar Casey health reading recommendations. Castor oil has been around for over a 1,000 years, and it's been uh, a medicine cabinet staple for hundreds of years. It was also called the Palma Christi or the Palm of Christ. It was domesticated in Eastern Africa and introduced to China from India about 1,400 years ago. That's a long time. The castor oil plant is one of the oldest cultivated crops in human history. It is said that castor oil was used in Cleopatra's beauty routine. 
She used it on her hair and also to whiten the brights of her eyes. Maybe she had dry eyes because it's often recommended for dry eyes treatments. And the castor oil properties, so castor oil is classified as a triglyceride fatty acid. About 90% of that fatty acid content is a specific um, rare compound called ricinoleic acid. And castor oil has very high concentrations of that acid. That makes that plant very unique. Uh, castor oil also contains flavonoids, phenolic compounds, amino acids, and terpenoids and phytosterols, as many other plants do. And the high levels of the ricinoleic acid helps with the lymphatic circulation um, by removing toxins. That castor oil has a really, like, it's very viscous and thick. If you guys have ever seen it, it's very viscous. So that's what the, probably the special property is that it aids in removing toxins. It pulls, has a really high pulling action. So it helps, you know, it improves circulation because of that and therefore improves our immune system, digestion, nutrient absorption, and colon health. Castor oil has been used in holistic medicine for a multitude of health conditions like arthritis, backaches, um, rheumatism, abdominal disorders, constipation, gallbladder issues, parasitic infections, and chronic headaches, PMS, and problems like insomnia and dry eyes. And it's probably mostly because of the, the whole circulation um, effect. And so here's how we might make our castor oil packs. So we have a bottle here, and this one's a little bit of a smaller bottle, so it would be like for one pack. And then you have your cotton flannel. You can also use um, the uh, wool flannel. Wool flannel is more recommended because it'll hold more of the oil. And then it becomes very thick, so you would take um, your oil, and then you're going to have your cotton sheeting or wool flannel, and then you're going you're gonna to need an old towel to lay on because if it drips on anything it's really really thick and it'll be hard to wash out and then so you'll need an electric heating pad like this one right here and so what you'll do is um, you'll also need a piece of uh, plastic it could be like plastic wrap or any kind of plastic plastic that you'll be able to place your whole pack on on top of rest it on top and then you'll put it in maybe like a glass container such as this right here and then just pour the oil over it Make sure it's well saturated but not dripping wet. And then you're going to put it on your heating pad. Well, the plastic will be under it so you don't get your heating pad dirty. So you're going to place it such you're going to place it like that and then let it get warm so that when you apply it to the skin it should be warm, not cold. So it doesn't shock your system. And then um Sandy, can you come up here? So we're going to just kind of we do this at home all the time. We're pros at packs now. <laughs> so one of the bi uh, probably the most common use was placing it on over your abdomen and your liver because liver is like a big huge filter for your blood. So placing it over here is going to really help digestion and pretty much everything that's related to the liver and di and your whole gut. So it would be over. You can put your shirt down too. Yeah. So <laughs> it would be like this, and then you, you're going to find a nice comfortable place to lie down on, like a couch, and maybe pick up a book or you know watch TV. And then um, you're going to lay on there and just for about two to three hours. Longer if you can. Some people sleep with it. And if you sleep with it, you'd probably take something like this and wrap it over so you don't wake up and it's all over your bed and such. Okay, that's good. Oh, this is an ace bandage. And you can actually pick up like bigger, bigger ace bandages so that you can wrap it all around your abdomen. And then this right here, you probably would need two of these because it has to be three thicknesses thick or three folds thick so that it really picks up a lot of the oil and it just goes right deep into your tissues. And so that's how you make the castor oil pack. Uh, and you can, um, when you take it off, you're going to be very like greasy thick. So you're going to need a little bit of uh, a solution made with baking soda and then wipe it off and then, you know, with the towel and then you'll be done. And then you'll take your, your, um, saturated uh, flannel and you can actually store it in a glass jar or a glass container and reuse it. You can reuse it and it's recommended to the castor oil pack um, depends on what you're using it for but most of the time it would be used maybe like three days in a row. You can sleep with it overnight or just two to three hours and then um, wash it off. So three days in a row take three days off and then three days more. That would be like a like a liver cleanse, liver gallbladder cleanse. And so then you can do that 
three days on, three off, and then take some time off. It depends on what you're treating, but if you're like constipated, you would do that until you got, you know, relief. And then um, the this pack often, uh, when you do like maybe two, when, you, when you've had it like three days in a row, it, um, a lot of the readings recommended that you went and had a colonic or a high enema because whatever has come out into your system is going to be released into your colon, especially from your liver or gallbladder. The other thing he recommended is taking two, two to three ta or one to two teaspoons of um, olive oil after you did a pa uh, like a three packs. And then that is going to help your gallbladder release any stones that are in there and then they're gonna go into your circulation and that's why it would be a good idea to get a colonic after you did like a, uh, maybe a set of two because that would be a very good gallbladder and colon or colon cleanse and liver cleanse. I've done like 12 of those actually and they work really, really well. Would your skin help with that? Not really, the skin, it's not like, you probably won't notice the skin, and you could also use the oil though on your face to treat like um, blemishes, and, and, but it, it, it does dry them up pretty quickly. You can use it on your eyelashes, on your eyebrows, and it's supposed to, because um, it, it increases circulation, it'll help in growth of eyelashes and eyebrows too. Yes, yes. Oh, you can't heat the pack in the microwave oven. Well, if you put that, like the castor oil pack, it's gonna become really high and it'll break down the oil. So probably a lot of the phyto, the nutrients in it, like the ricinoleic acid might become inactivated. Plus, it would probably be not really safe to do because it's going to heat it really high, and it could burn you, burn your skin. So that's not recommended ever. So, and um, okay, so, so yeah, like I said, the pack should remain between one and a half hours to two. I've slept with it on at times. If I have a backache, sometimes I'll put it on. Like I had sciatica not too long ago, and then um, I I was doing you know yoga and just trying all these things until I said, well, why don't I just try the castor oil pack and I did like three three days of it and it it actually it's almost completely gone now and I've had it for like about a month so it really works What's the science it? it's the oil it's going it's the going into your tissues and the heat that heat drives it in more into your tissues and it's absorbed by your tissues I mean you know I guess all the way down to your cell yeah no and and actually, so they recommend that if, you know, you're going to use those packs in your family, it's one per person. You shouldn't be like, re it's one per person. And you can use it up to six months is what the recommendations are. And then get rid of it and start all over again. I have about like 32 ounce um, container of castor oil. And then that would probably last a while. But yeah, and I have it actually in, in a glass jar, but any, any oil will do. And so... Like I said, so you're done with it, you're gonna place it in a jar in a glass container. Because if you put it in plastic, it might kind of break down because it's, it's really viscous. And uh, let's see, so yeah, again, so you use it alternating three days on, three days off, and then drinking the one to two teaspoons of olive oil when you're finished. And then yeah, after the third application, um, he, it was advised to get a colonic after a series of packs, and that's actually very cleansing. You would be surprised how much better you will feel if you try one of these. Has anyone ever tried the packs? You have, Steve? Wow. Well, both. Both in combination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um, there's some precautions with the castor oil. Um, it's classified by the FDA as generally safe for both topical and internal use. Taken orally though, there's gonna be some strong side effects like um, cramping, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, especially if you use it in large amounts. That's because it's moving and pulling a lot and it's very viscous and thick. So, And then castor oil falls into category X if for pregnant women because that's how it's actually been used to induce labor and it was in the old, old days. And um, High heat's not recommended if you have active infections or like excessive gases. It's, it's going to move a lot more and probably cause more pain. And during menses or with a recent injury that's less than 48 hours old, probably because of the inflammatory process going on. You don't want to interrupt that. And then some, yes. Uh -huh. They're pretty much all the same. Yeah. 
And so here's a case history that I thought was really interesting, and it came from Dr. William McGarry's book on the oil that heals. And this case history came from a young woman um, in a Search for God study group that shared a personal story on how castor oil helped her father's serious snoring problem. And she wrote, my parents are both sleeping better now thanks to the castor oil pack. My mother has insisted that dad wear a pack every night for the last two weeks. Now, instead of being kept awake by loud gutturals, choking snores, and frequent angry outcries originating from nightly dreams of fighting, the snoring has ceased totally, and he, she is occasionally awakened by the most whimsical giggling coming from the original offender. <laughs> Mom also reports an enhanced, enhanced sense of humor, a very affectionate husband, and spirit of cooperation that just won't quit. Wow, miracles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. I well, I think that yeah, yeah covered his face. Yeah, <laughs> probably a lot of it may may has to have to do with just like the uh, detoxifying and the cleansing. And I mean, your gut is like your second brain, really. So there's a lot of neurotransmitters made from here that if you're really toxic and you know have a lot of built up stores and your colon is really dirty, that and I don't know if he had colonics, maybe not, but the, ta the, the castor oil apparently really affected it. But it's really because the castor oil has such a strong effect on your lymphatic system. And that's for circulation. That's for everything. Your lymphatic system is like probably like the trash can of the whole system. It picks up toxicities from your, your, um, your whole system. I mean, you have like a lot of lymphatics here in your gut. So it, that's why it works so well by placing that patch over your gut and your liver. Yeah, like, yeah, the right side. Yeah, you could get a big enough, I mean, you'd have to get a couple of them because, you know, it depends on how big, but you want to cover your entire side like this because your liver is all along here. No, you don't have to. Yeah. More here because the liver's here and then, you know, most of your, I mean, yeah, it's this side that you're more concerned for. I mean, if you were using it for like, um, you could use it on your whole stomach if you wanted, but most of it was focused on the liver and then the soul, because the liver is like, you know, just, it, it filters all your blood, all of it. It's a big, huge filter. So you want to focus on this area and kind of wrap it a little bit around your right flank. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I thought that was very interesting. I, I, yeah, I wish I had someone to try it on, but he's not around anymore. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> that would be really very interesting. And then this reading um, was given September of 1940 for someone with liver and gallbladder disturbances. So the, the reading says, cast oil packs taken each evening for three days in succession, and then the, uh, a large dose of olive oil taken internally, leave it off three, three to four days and then take another series, and then continue in that manner until the condition has entirely cleared. Um, then leave it off three to four weeks, and then repeat regularly in serious even though there's not the severe pain and like I said he always recommended colonic irrigations after this oh that's right yes this is yeah this this was for him because he had and and from my personal experience doing the liver cleanses you do see stones in the colonic oh yeah and I didn't think I'd have that many stones because I think well I'm vegan I shouldn't oh yeah there's lots of stones yes mm -hmm. and then we're going to talk about the great poultice and then this is a little bit on um, grapes in history. So grapes have been around for thousands of years. Uh, according to the University of Missouri, archaeologists have evidence of grape growing um, as far back as 6,500 6, BC in what are now Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Grapes and wine were important in dining and social rituals in ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome. And several species of grapes are native to the Americas. And most notably the Concord grape. That's the very dark grape with seeds is preferred. So grapes and especially the Concord grape variety contain phytonutrients including phenols, polyphenols, resveratrol, carotenoids with, which are essential for cellular main maintenance and regeneration. And the Concord grape variety uh, was most often recommended in the readings. Um, for to reduce fever and inflammation and most specifically for inflammatory bowel disease. So Concord grape packs were prescribed for abdominal discomfort, abdominal abscesses, peritonitis, appendicitis, gastritis, colitis, pelvic disorders, tumors, 
ulcers, food poisoning, and other serious abdominal conditions. So it was more anti-inflammatory. So the readings recommended them to be eaten. You can drink them and use them in abdominal poultices. The grapes should be seeded because the seeds contain that tartaric acid, which is a vital component for detoxification. The grape mono diet was sometimes recommended along with the poultices for internal cleansing. So you, he would recommend the poultices placed on your abdomen, and then you would eat grapes or drink a little bit of juice every day. He, sometimes it was before meals, like a little bit of juice before meals, because that didn't, like helped your digestion process. So the instructions for the grape poultice, I don't have grapes, but you basically take as much grapes as what you need for your pack. You're going to mash them down with everything, the grapes and skins, because most of the nutrients come from the skins. So uh, the grape poultice therapy varies depending upon the condition of the individual, and the grape poultice should be used at least once each week. For acute conditions, the great poultice may be used almost continually, continuously until the relief is achieved. So great, the supplies you'll need is maybe one to three pounds of Concord variety grapes with the seeds. Crush everything, and then you place about, um, and I, I would use maybe like a cotton sheeting like this. It's just pure cotton. And you would smash your grapes, take them, place them in between the folds, and then um, making sure it's really saturated, you would basically have the plastic again, place it over your abdomen, and you can use a heating pad over those too. And it's probably a messy, it's going to be very messy too, so you would always want to lay down a towel wherever you're going to lie down. And so, yeah, about one to one and a half inches of grape hull and pulp between the layers of gauze, and then um, you place a poultice over your whole entire abdomen from the stomach to the below the navel because that's where your stomach is at. So right, this whole area, the center area, and um, leave the poultice on until it actually dries. You just let it dry, because that means everything got absorbed in there. And then you can take the, the rest of it and put it in your garden or something. <laughs> and so in, in the readings, um, let me go back. and um, So most of the, the, the great poultices were recommended until the inflammation subsided. So a lot of times if it was used for like a colitis or if you had just like, if you have like Crohn's and it was recommended that you use it, just like the castor oil pack, like three days on, leave it off three days, and then drink a little bit of juice continuously. But it, that, that one actually doesn't, re doesn't recommend a pack. It's just you, you're going to leave it on until it dries, and you're just going to lay there for however long it takes for it to dry. And so this reading um, given June of 1944 for a female with colitis, which was inflammatory inflammation of the large intestine, very common. Um, the reading recommended also recommended colonics and a spinal manipulation after the completion of the poultices, a series. Uh, so the reading says, as we would find first, there would be the application of crushed grapes over the abdomen. Preferably, these would be the Concord variety. None are available at present except the preserved or California grapes. He even knew if there was any available, probably back east. S hence, the next best would be the, those of purple variety. Crush them, place them on gauze, and apply on the abdomen. Let remain until, apparent, uh, until apparently these have almost dried on the body. This would require an hour and a half to three hours. And then in this reading given May of 1944 for a female with intestinal flu, so do apply over the whole abdomen at least once a week and the crushed grapes, these should be used with the hull and the seed. The pack should be at least one inch thick and let this remain on until it has almost dried out from the body heat, which would require about uh, four to four and a half hours. Make this pack sufficiently large to cover the whole abdomen, and again, put the grape poultice in the gauze, and that's how, that's the application. And then uh, one more here, so this reading given September of 1942 for a 56-year-old female with constipation. That He also recommended like peanut, olive, lanolin, oil rubs, colonics, and then drinking grape juice after a series of poultices. So the reading says, in the present, while the body rests, we would have the grape poultice applied over the upper and lower abdomen, so pretty much the entire abdomen, and covering some as to keep absorption with the heat from the body to give strength. Use the Concord grapes, preferably, though if these are not available, use the larger variety, dark grapes. Crush the same character of grapes and drink the fresh grape juice from them. This will give the body strength. Follow these with the oil rubs, the combination of the peanut, olive, and lanolin. 
these given about two or three hours apart should soon bring the strength back to the body. Yeah, well, that sounds pretty good to me, massage. And then the colonics, because the, the grapes are going to move a lot of stuff around, and then the, you know, it ends up in your main circulation, so in your colon, so you want to keep that out so that you can cleanse the colon. And then uh, this next reading given to a female in October of 1938 with a uterine infection. So it says to reduce the temperature as well as the inflammation through the abdomen and colon specific, we would use grape poultices, preferably, again, con concord grapes. Crush the same, put between the gauze at least half an inch thick directly to the abdominal area and then make the pack sufficiently large to cover the whole area of the colon and abdomen you see, and he said you see all the time in his reading. So let it remain until warm from the body heat or as hot as you can tolerate it. Then change and put on a fresh pack. It should not be necessary in this particular case for more than two such poultices. Again, if it was, I guess, like a very acute inflammation, he would recommend the poultices like continuously until it subsided and there was relief. And now we get to the mighty potato. And so potato poultices have been used for hundreds of years to dry out infection and to relieve inflammation. So the skins are very rich in fiber, iron, zinc, potassium, and calcium, and they also contain B and C vitamins. A raw potato poultice is made by grating or chopping it, and this action helps to release the active enzymes from the potato, mainly the peel, and they have an anti-inflammatory and detoxifying effect on your cells. Has anyone ever used a potato pack? Wow, because I remember as a child, my mom used potato packs and onion packs on our feet to, when we had fevers to dry out the fever and yeah this is in Mexico so they were I guess they're they're worldwide so potato poultices most often they were recommended for eye conditions and Edgar Casey recommended them for also for irritations or inflammation such as swollen eyelids or styes the frequency of the treatment varied with the severity of the condition so typically the poultice uh, was recommended to be used each morning and evening until the inflammation or irritation subsided. The readings um, sometimes suggested cycles of the treatment wherein the poultice was used for two or three days and then resting and then a couple of days before resuming the cycle. So most of these packs were all in cycles, like three on, three off until, unless it's like a, you know, like an acute colonic or colon inflammation then with the gray packs and it was like continuously until relief was achieved and most of the time uh, the use of the, all poultices would be integrated into a comprehensive treatment plan that included other therapeutic modalities like spinal adjustments, um, eye washes if it's for your eyes, ointments. So most of them are just like if you actually took the reading you you would be reading for hours because it included even like the you know whoever was given the reading they would write back and, and t uh, communicate how it worked for them or ask for more readings. And so for the potato poultice instructions, um, you would want to use like older potatoes, not brand new ones. You want the older ones, well, I guess where most of the enzymes and, and um, vitamins and minerals have, are releasing already into the potatoes. So you want them organic if possible and um, not sprouted or frozen. You don't want them old enough that they're sprouting. You don't want that because that's growing already. And yeah, you don't want those. And so you can wash them thoroughly and then you would grate them like with the potato peeler, but probably like a, a cheese grater. That's what, that's what kind of fine is you want so that it, most of the, the uh, enzymes are released into your, in, into your poultice. And you uh, take that grated potato and place it over gauze again, like thinner gauze, especially if it's going to be for your eyes. And you want a thinner gauze and place it over the affected eye or eyes. Um, you can leave it on for 30 to 60 minutes per session. And then when you're done, you would wash your eyes out with a weak uh, solution, like a 20% boric acid solution. And I thought, well, where would I find that? Well, actually, it's in most um, eye, eye drops at any of your drugstores. For severe cases, the readings sometimes recommended washing the eyes before and after the potato poultice to make sure that you got your small stuff out. Yes? Are you familiar with the uh, story of his oldest son, Hugh Lin? No. Oh, what the... When he spilled the, the solution, what was it? It was actually that Edgar Casey, being a photographer, Hugh Lynn, when he was about five years old, had gotten uh, into a splash powder Ooh, and oh. caused an explosion. And the doctor oh. said, you, your son is going to be blind for life. We're going to have to remove one eye. 
and it was Hugh Lynn at five years old that convinced his father to go ahead and give him a reading and said oh. that uh, was coming up with the potato poultice in mm -hmm. which not only did he regain his vision, he didn't need glasses for years after that. Wow. I, I do remember reading it in, the, in his two books. That's amazing. Yep. And I guess the doctors were completely against it, and then he says, no, we're going to try it anyway. I mean, what do you have to lose? But it's like, like That was why the doctors said, go ahead and do it. It's not going to yeah. hurt anything, and he's going to be blind anyway, and they couldn't mm -hmm. see it causing any more damage, and it ended yeah. up healing him. Yeah, that's interesting. Definitely. And so some of the readings in this one, given November of 1922 for a female child with an eye condition, so um, when the conditions produced that causes inflammation to be apparent in the eye where cold or congestion sets in from the predisposing predisposition of forces in the system, we would apply locally small quantities of scra scraped Irish potato to the eye to dry out the inflammation. This will seldom have to be used for a time, yet the adjustment for the condition along the cervical through osteopathic treatment should be done, else we will create the predisposition with those conditions existent in the system to cause the weaknesses of forces to the eye to become a constitutional condition rather than organic condition. And then this one given November of 1943 for an adult female. And she says, my eyes are deeply inflamed, especially the left one and, and have been in this condition for years and no one can tell me the cause or what to do for it. Although I have been the rounds of specialist and all kinds of remedies have been tried. It is a deep-seated conjunctivitis and will not be cured. My eyes look awful. Sometimes I get so low that I even think of ending it all. But I can't do that either, for I'm a Christian. Only God can help me now. And as you are his instrument, I feel that you will know through your visions while sleeping. The Bible tells us that in the latter days, some will have the gift of dreams and visions and of healing. And then the response was, there are very aggravating conditions for the disturbances arise from the breaking of the activities between the sensory system, its circulation, its lymph activity, and the organs of the central nervous system, and the eliminating system. So she was very lymphatically backed up, basically. So do set up better eliminations by having regular periods when small quantities of, mineral, of a mineral laxative would be taken. A teaspoon every morning for five days, leave off for at least two weeks, and then take for five days again for five days again. Each and every evening have scraped pota Irish potato, old, not new, and apply gauze over the eyes. Keep this on for at least one hour and then cleanse the eye with any good antiseptic solution using a co cotton tuft for the same. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. He would give them and then the his stenographer would like take all the information down. Mm -hmm. And then we go to Epsom salts. And Epsom apparently came from, well, it's known as magnesium sulfate, and it's chemical compound made up of magnesium, sulfur, and oxygen. When, when the salt is dissolved it, in the water, it releases the magnesium and the sulfate ions. So the Epsom salts were named after the town of Epsom in Surrey, Ingl England, where it was originally discovered. Um, despite its name, Epsom salt is a completely different compound than table salt. It was most likely termed salt because of the chemical structure. And so while it looks similar to, to, to salt, it's often dissolved in baths, and it tastes very bitter and very unpalatable. I mean, it's really strong. I'm sure, has anyone ever tried it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very strong. So uh, magnesium is the fourth most abundant mineral in the body next to calcium and it is involved in more than 325 um, biochemical reactions that benefit your heart and nervous system. It's very soothing to your nervous system. Many people don't consume enough magnesium in their diets, so in addition, there's many factors that can interfere with its absorption in your body. So the benefits um, promote sleep and relaxation, stretch, stress reduction. Um, adequate magnesium levels are essential for sleep and stress management likely because magnesium helps your brain produce neurotransmitters and that induces sleep and reduces stress. Um, it also helps your body produce melatonin, a hormone that promotes better sleep. And it also helps with constipation. So magnesium is often used to treat constipation because it draws out water into your colon which promotes bowel movements. So magnesium citrate or magnesium hydroxide are the two oral formulations that are most use, used for 
constipation. And I say it works really well because we give it in the hospital all the time and it does work pretty quick. And then it's also important for exercise performance and recovery, so um, it can help with muscle soreness and relieving cramps and reduce with swelling and arthritis. It's also well known that adequate magnesium levels are at, um, helpful for exercise performance and recovery because the magnesium um, helps your body use glucose and it reduces lactic acid levels. So oral supplements can also help um, adequate magnesium levels in your body. But the Epsom salt fats are really, really good. And from what I read, it says that um, if you're going to take an Epsom salt bath, it sh it's like one cup for every 60 pounds. So that's how much you add to your solution, to your bath water, to ensure that you're getting enough in your system. And, and the, the water should be as hot as you can tolerate it, because when you open up those pores and the magnesium can go in there much easier and faster. And so these are the indications. So um, Epsom salt stoops were used um, for adhesions, which is basically scar tissue that's formed between your abdominal tissues and organs, causing them to stick together. And the reason that happens sometimes is from inflammation that's unchecked by eating the wrong foods. Or maybe you have like, maybe if you had a surgical, like an like operation to repair anything and it doesn't heal adequately, you might form scar tissue. And so that's what a lot of the Epsom salt stoops were um, recommended for. So also for arthritis, for eliminations, again, intestinal problems, for lesions, for liver, um, for the liver, for impaired locomotion, lumbago, neuritis, pelvic disorders, rheumatism, spinal subluxations, and tumors. And when I do like a liver cleanse, I drink a little bit of the Epsom salts and that right there, oh yeah, you get a really good cleanse with that when you mix all that together, but that's. And then um, contraindications, you wouldn't want to use it if you have high blood pressure, but most people probably wouldn't know that they have high blood pressure because they really don't go to the doctor until they have a stroke or something. So. Um, also, you can't use it on new injuries if they're like between 48 and 72 hours because you want to let that kind of rest because there's already enough inflammation going on in there, so you want to wait a little bit. And um, so what it does is it actually helps uh, draw toxins and it reduces the inflammation and swelling because it's basically when you make the Epsom salt solution, it's going to be a really hypertonic solution. So hypertonic draws from your cells and it pulls and has a pulling effect. And then you, uh, the frequency to be used would be like um, the pack would be left on for 30 to 60 minutes or until it's dried um, once a day or every other day once a week. And so the instructions are, I didn't bring the Epsom salt, but you guys probably most of the time know what it is. You can get it at any drugstore or, or grocery store. It's very common. So for the Epsom salt, you want to like heat two cups of water until it's very hot and then add, start adding the Epsom salt, stirring them in there until the salt no longer dissolves. So the way you know if you have a fully saturated solution is you're going to see some, some of the uh, salt on the bottom of the pan, and that's when you know there's enough in that solution to make it effective. So you're going to take your cotton sheeting, and it would be, again, something like this, just plain cotton, so it ab absorbs it. And you're going to dip it in the towel very carefully because the water will be hot, but you have to wait till it kind of cools down to you know, put it in there, saturate it, kind of wring out the excess, and then fold to fit in the area. And you can use it wherever. I mean, you can use it wherever the inflammation is at, on your feet or on your abdomen, um, anywhere that you're having. Probably more, most of the time you're going to use it on your feet, maybe on your knees or your abdomen. So you're going to um, put it on until it's comfortable enough to the touch. You don't want it too hot so that it burns your skin, but just comfortable as hot as you can handle it again so that it increases the, um, so it goes into your circulation, into your tissues. And then cover it with a hand towel or you can also use a, another plastic sheet on there. And then you want to use a hot water bottle on it to keep it moist and hot. And then I, I say a hot water bottle because you probably don't want to use uh, an electric pack with the water solution. The oil's okay but not on water just because of the electrical, you know, in case something goes wrong with your pack, you don't want that. <laughs> you don't want to be electrified. And then uh, you would keep it on for one to two hours or until it's dried and then rinse it with just plain water. And here's some readings um, with the Epsom salt pack. So reading given in October of 1935 to a 47-year-old male. And so um, this is Edgar Casey says, yes, we find the general conditions much improved while there is still felt the uneasiness throughout the abdomen and stomach. 
the tendency for weakness and dizziness, we find that with another application today of the PAX, as indicated, with the use of a high enema and the taking of a little stimulant and wine that's light in nature, there should be a clearing of these conditions. So maybe the wine's for inducing a little more relaxation, but also probably because of the phytonutrients and resveratrol in there. And he says, um, so then the male asked um, Edgar Casey, do you prefer Epsom salt packs or great poultices? And he says, the Epsom salt packs were preferable at this time as indicated. There is not so much inflammation as a tendency for congestion. See, hence the relaxation by the use of the Epsom salts. And while the great poultices are rather to dissipate inflammation. Yes. And then uh, the third question, he says, what causes a faint feeling? Uh, and the answer is the flow of the blood to the central portion of the system and reacting to the pulsations or to the nerve forces in the head. These stimulated by any stimulant to the body as indicated will be relieved. Again, because Epsom salt or magnesium sulfate just calms your system down. So, and then this one, this is a continuation of the same reading. This reading was a very long reading. This, this guy had a lot of issues. So. He says, what can I do to gain resistance against these attacks? Apparently he had dizziness also. And so he says, as indicated, a rest period or rather budgeting the time so as to not overtax the body in either way, we would regain the equilibrium. And then the other question says, should I have a colonic or the ordinary high enema? And then he says, a colonic irrigation is preferable for where congestion is indicated in the jejunum. That's like the lower portion of your small intestine. And after the effects of inflammation, there is a tendency to make for an accumulation in the colon, especially in the ascending. So the colonic would be necessary to cleanse from those areas on the right side throughout the area of the colon itself. To be sure the solutions used should carry oil or the agar preparations in such measures to, as to make for elasticity in the activity or the flow of the lymph circulation through these portions of the body. And I think in that part he's talking about the colonic irrigations. The colonic irrigations like maybe like 10 enemas because it, it really goes in and it goes all the way all the way to your ascending colon. So here's your ascending colon transverse and then down. And so you want to get that water deep in there to clean up and pull out all the junk that's laying around in your colon. I know it sounds scary but it's not really. <laughs> and then we get to glycothymoline which is this little bottle here with a lot of really good ingredients in it. So glycothymoline is a mouthwash and gargle solution. It's manufactured by Crescent Owen Company and it's been around for 125 years. The formulation, well the bottle's different but it's, it's still this, yeah, for 125 years. So this mouthwash was uh, developed to counter the increasingly acid diet effect associated with the American industrial era. So that's what we're eating now. That's a standard American diet that causes a lot of acid in your mouth. So the active ingredients in the solution are menthol, eucalyptal, pine oil, and thymol. These natural and soothing ingredients help support a normal pH balance in your mouth, but also your entire digestive system. So the indications for using the glycothymoline. Um, glycothymoline may be used as a treatment for mucosity. So that's abnormal, excessive uh, mucus secretions. And that alkaline cleansing solution for soothing mucous membranes can also be used as a soothing, cleansing, non-irritating solution for feminine hygiene or oral hygiene, baby simple skin irritations, minor burns, poison ivy, sunburn, and chapping of the skin. It's very alkaline solution and so that's why it would be indicated for those conditions. And then this, um, there were over 810 readings given on the use of glycothymoline in the readings and so they often recommend it as a, also an, as an anti intestinal antiseptic, and for eye irritations, sinusitis, tonsillitis, pelvic disorders, and spinal problems. The stoops, which are also known as packs, are made by using two or three thicknesses, that same cotton sheeting that I showed you. Um, and then you're going to warm up the glycothymoline enough to soak your, your cloth, and then you're going to apply it to the affected area with or without heat. Uh, KC readings often suggested applicating uh, the application of the unheated glycothymoline pack by wrapping it around your face and your throat for tonsillitis or sinusitis. And so the instructions are you're going to fill, fill um, you know, like a plastic or a glass container and then put your 
heat it. Well, you're going to heat it first of all. And you can use a pan, or I wouldn't put it in the microwave really ever. So sometimes you can heat it in a, in a small pan, or at times you can add hot water, maybe like one part solution of hot water to three parts of the glycothymoline to make your pack to heat it up. And so um, you're going to fold the cotton about two to three layers deep so that it's very saturated, but wring out any excess solution. And then you apply it on the affected area with plastic again to prevent soiling because that's red and it will stain clothes. And you can also use a, wa uh, a hot water bottle to keep the pack warm. If it's on your eyes, probably not want to use it hot. Probably just covering it with plastic will keep it from evaporating. And so apply that to the affected areas for maybe 20 to 30 minutes or longer if needed. It may be used three to four times a week or as needed if you're not getting, you know, if you need it, if you have sinusitis and it's not going away, so you could probably keep using it. And these are the hot water packs I'm talking about because I, I'm, if I say hot water bottle, people might think you're going to heat up a water bottle and then, you know, so <laughs> for the younger ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, they're still sold everywhere. And so here's some of the readings um, on glycothymoline. So the reading given September of 1935 for a female adult with blood and limb circulation issues. It says occasionally we'd, we would use a spray of glycothymoline for throat and for nasal passages. So apparently they sell the spray, spray solution too. And put one part of water, two, three parts of glycothymoline. Will that this be warmed by setting in warm water used in a spray to the nasal passages and through the throat? This may be begun at once, but will be more reactive as the blood su supply is purified. And in the next reading given, April 1944, for a five-month-old baby with a spinal deformity. So the reading says we would begin in the present, giving the body each, every day, each day a very hot bath, whether morning or evening, evening the better, for it should be allowed to rest or sleep after the treatment. This should be not so hot as to be uncomfortable to the body. Immediately afterwards, place over the area on the spinal column two thicknesses of heavy cotton cloth saturated with the glycothymoline. Place over this for five to ten minutes. A hot water bottle, not dry heat, not an electric pad, but a hot water bottle, and let it be pretty warm. Do this consistently and persistently. And so this reading was very long, but in February of 1959, like years later, after Edgar Casey had passed, of course, the father of the child sent a letter to the ARE that said, your father did a reading for my daughter, and we follow the directions to the letter, plus prayer and more prayer, and today our daughter walks without a brace or operation on her spina bifida and leads an active, full life. Many thanks. I thought that was pretty interesting. Oops. Okay. And, okay. So, you can, if you're a member of the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Of the packs? Like, like so many different types of diagnosis. Probably like the castor oil, I mean, it's going to be used because it's very, um, it works on the lymphatic system overall. So that's what the castor, it's castor oil is really for, it's, it's, it pulls, so it's more of a lymphatic, and your lymphatic system is like, it doesn't really, your, your, um, it doesn't move unless you're moving around, and, and so it, if you don't do a lot of physical activity, then your lymphatic system can be very congested. I mean, and there's other factors that probably would make it congested. I mean, like drinking a lot of dairy would make me congested too. Um, but, and then like the potato poultices are probably more and more um, because of what the enzymes that are released are, you know, apparently very beneficial to your eyes and pulling out, it's got a pulling effect. I'd say most of these have a pulling effect, but in different ways, maybe anti-inflammatory or they maybe affect your circulation such as the lymphatic because anything that affects your lymphatic is pretty much your overall circulation because the lymphatic system is connected to your blood to your blood circulation also. So we got at any so anytime there's congestions or anything's backed up anywhere then that also makes you more toxic cuz that lymphatic system pulls out toxins from the the blood supply. So it's got to be like a continuous continuous circulation anything that's stagnant can cause more acid formation in the body. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, actually, Bill McGarry had written those books, but his uh, wife, Gladys, Dr. Gladys McGarry, uh, who is still alive, yes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, she lives here locally, and I had actually mm -hmm. spoken with her about this. She had a, an interesting take that they weren't able to necessarily scientifically prove, mm -hmm. but I think it addresses Mary's question earlier as far as what's the science behind this. Yeah. And it's especially with castor oil that it's, I think the term that she used was agitant, that it would actually agitate the system mm. to be able to cause the healing vibrations and properties of the body to go to the affected area and facil facilitate a greater healing to go along with that. That was her take on the entire yeah. thing over and above everything that her husband did in his research. Wow. Yep. And she is, she lives here in Scottsdale, right? Yeah. yeah she's a fascinating lady. So anyway, um, I, if you're a member, member of the Edgar Casey Association for Research and Enlightenment, you can get, you have access to the online database of the entire set of 14,306 readings. And you can spend days reading these because each reading is followed up by, you know, like people that would write back and, and share if the, the remedies worked or not or what else they needed. And so it's fascinating to get into there and read them. You can also visit headquarters in Virginia Beach and have, um, the, the library is open to the public daily. So you can have access through there. And, and then I thought I'd have a slide on, on the COVID-19 prevention. This is straight from the CDC, since everyone's talking about the coronavirus. And I couldn't really like pass up an opportunity to you know give some prevention education tips. So the best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to the virus. So the virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person and between people who are in close contact, such as us here. Um, so the droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes can land on the mouths or noses of people who are nearby or possibly inhaled into their lungs. So hand washing is the best thing you can do, really. Hand washing your hands for at least 20 seconds, though. So maybe singing a happy birthday song completely twice will be long enough. And, and most of us probably don't wash that long unless we are trained in the hospital to do that, which I am, and I know how long I have to wash my hands. But most people don't, I mean, you, if, if at all, probably. So so wash your hands, especially after you've been in a public area, or if you blew your nose or you coughed or you sneezed, and wash your hands. Um, if soap and water aren't readily available, then you can use a hand sanitizer that, that everyone's fighting over right now. But really, soap and water are the most effective ways to you know get rid of germs on your hands. So also avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth with unwashed hands. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue when you cough or sneeze or use the inside of your elbow and immediately wash your hands with soap and water after you're done. Also avoid close contact with people who are sick. Stay home if you're sick except to get medical care. I mean you have to get and go get help you know from a doctor or a hospital and learn to do what to, learn to know what to do if you're sick. Say you, you really have these symptoms where you have a fever and you're coughing. Call the hospital ahead of time even if you're really feeling sick so that they can give you instructions on where to come in so that you don't go in there and infect everyone else in the waiting room. And um, wear a mask if you are sick. If you are really sick, then wear a mask, but don't just wear a mask because you want to prevent being infected. Just wear a mask if you're sick. Um, if you're not sick, then you, you don't have to wear it. Um, if you're caring for someone that's sick, you should wear it, but really face masks are in short supply, and I know that because I work in the hospital, so we have run out of the simple face masks that we can use. Now we have to use some that you have to tie twice and when you do this 50 times a day, and then you have smooth hair like mine, they just fall off all the time, so it's really annoying. <laughs> but, and so anyway, um, clean and disinfect your frequently touched areas in your home, and that includes tables, doorknobs, light switches, countertops, handles, phones, desks, keyboards, <laughs> toilets, faucets, and sinks. So wash them and disinfect them. And so that way you prevent just the, you know, transfer of germs from your hands to the doorknobs. But especially when you come in from being out, you know, shopping around or if you went out to the movies or whatever, just wash your hands. Wash your hands every time. And I know that, you know, we all are like, you know, want to hug and hug people. What, try not hugging people right now. <laughs> but don't be so afraid that your fear just keeps you, you know, because the fear can also make acid conditions in your body and that'll just invite more germs to reproduce in your system. And those are the germs that will get you. So just kind of relax a little and you know be kind and don't freak out because you're just you know you're going to cause yourself to be sicker because you're in fight or flight mode and that's not restorative to your system at all so those are the tips from the cdc 
And we are seeing a lot more people in the hospital, but more flu related. I mean, this year it seems like even our whole hospital stat's been affected. So we're working like very hard, we're getting like extra patients because everyone's out sick right now. So it's been really tough this, this um, season. And more now because more people are going into the hospital because they think that they have the coronavirus. So it's been, yeah, a um, pretty tough situation the last few weeks. And that's it. Any questions from anyone? Anything I can expand on? Or has anyone ever tried any of these packs and poultices? I have some questions. Yes. <coughs> so they talk about, oh, okay. Hello there. Mm -hmm. uh, is that okay? Um, uh, athletic injuries and one of the, like, which one it was the, oh, the Epsom, Epsom salt? 48 to 72 hours. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on which one of those? Probably, probably because in the first 48 to 72 hours, you want to apply cold packs mm -hmm. versus an Epsom salt to relax. Yeah, and that's probably, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to do cold and, you know, rest, elevate and compress. And then you probably want to move on to the, to the uh, Epsom salt packs because okay. they're going to be warmer. So you want to just give the yeah. time because in the first 48 to 72 hours your your body is going to stimulate a lot of heat anyway because it's trying to repair itself so you want to kind of let that happen and support it by you know just elevating whatever limbs injured putting ice on it and then after that you want to move on to those packs probably would be a lot beneficial for you All right. mm -hmm. thanks you're welcome Um, I have a question about the time period. Mm -hmm. How were these treatments um, comparable to whatever else was going on medically at the time period? At the time, I think they were better, very beneficial as long as a person was consistent and persistent with it. And that is the key probably to everything. I mm -hmm. mean, back in the past, for us, yeah. was this common? Yeah, oh yeah, it was very common. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I mean, these these uh, packs are still used commonly, but a lot of people don't know about them. They are, especially like the potato, even the Epsom salt still probably used universally. Mm -hmm. Even the, the the onion packs that I didn't, you know, discuss, but my mom used onion packs all the time too on 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 feed on babies, especially babies. You put, you know, like diced onions and then make them packs and put them on their feet for fevers. Yeah, <laughs> or potatoes. So they are, and they're still used in in some circles, but probably not people that just, you know, want to go to the, the, to doctors all the time and get pills and antibiotics and steroids. And I mean, they are good in, in you know, like extreme conditions, but there's a lot of other things you can do before you get there or maybe along with that to help your body. Mm -hmm. To answer your question about what else was going on when this was happening, Casey was very, was a proponent of doing the natural healing versus injections, versus surgery, and versus pharmaceuticals. There was some, all of that going on at that time, but Casey was not a proponent of those. And in very, very few cases, and I want to say looking at reading during two cases, did he recommend surgery? because rest of it could be healed with the natural ways that he was putting forth. So that's mm -hmm. what else was going on at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was raised on the Edgar Casey readings and uh, while I was very much into preventative and uh, just maintaining good health through diet, exercise and all that, the one that I found the most helpful is uh, glycothymoly to be able oh. to take uh, I, it was a capsule call it a not a half ounce of the glyco into a glass of water mm -hmm. just dump it right into a glass of water and then to down that because as Doris said the uh, it's it's a very highly alkaline solution and mm -hmm. that will bring an alkaline uh, or cause more alkaline in the system which mm -hmm. is that germs cannot live in an alkaline system is what the readings say so mm -hmm. that's one of the most common uses of it that people get colds all the time, whether it's a, you know, CDC issue or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very common. Mm 